Welcome to the CEO Breakfast and Strategy Series, uh, co-hosted by the Schneider School of Business and Economics at St. Norbert College. I'm Brian Brees, the president of the college, and it's my great delight to welcome you here. Uh, this, our 21st year of the CEO Series, provides executives uh, a chance to hear from some of our top area CEOs. This resource is being brought to you through the generosity of our presenting sponsor, WPS Health Solutions. Title sponsors are Myron Construction, Johnson Bank, Johnson Insurance, and Insight Publications. The sponsor for this session is Investors Community Bank. Could you please give the sponsor a round of applause for their support? <laughs> at your table, uh, you have folders with information from the sponsors. We encourage you to take a look at that and uh, support our sponsors as we move into, the, move into the future. It's my great privilege to introduce now Mike uh, Brennan, Father Mike Brennan, College Chaplain, Director of Norberteen Vocations, who will offer grace for us. Father Mike. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, on this cold fall day, we thank you for the warmth of our homes, the warmth of this place, the warmth of the love that you offer us, and the warmth of conversation that we share. In this month of November, where we take a moment to honor those uh, who have laid down their lives for our country, as we honor the saints and those that have gone before us, as we give thanks for so many blessings in our lives, we thank you this morning for blessing us with this opportunity to gather and to, to grow together, to grow in understanding of one another, to grow in our love for you and love for neighbor. We ask that you send your spirit amongst us as we share conversation, as we share the bounty of this table. We ask that you bless this food, bless those that help bring it to this table, and bless those that are not so fortunate as, as we are. We give thanks for all of these many blessings. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. It is now my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce Ms. Karen Nelson and Mayor Tim Hanna. Ms. Nelson serves as the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator for the City of Appleton. Over the course of her career, she's worked in large corporate settings and has also owned uh, her own consulting firm focused on assisting companies develop and deploy their diversity initiatives. She's a member of the Fox Valley Society of Human Resource Management, the National Association of African American Resources, Milwaukee, and a member of the Delta Sigma Theta International <coughs> Public Service Sorority. She earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Bennett College and executive MBA from Luber School of Business Management at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Let's give her a round, huh? <laughs> Mr. Hanna, a lifelong resident of the city, De Pere, has served as the city's mayor since 1996. What did I say? De Pere? Well, I was with the mayor of De Pere yesterday. <laughs> who also took the mayorship in the first year was in 1996 as well. So we have two fabulous mayors, one in De Pere and one in Appleton. <laughs> we host uh, a half of these uh, seminars, these uh, breakfasts in Appleton because uh, we love Appleton. So it's good to be here, Mayor. <laughs> The hallmark of Mayor Hanna's administration has been the use of strategic planning to aid the city in focusing on its mission of delivering services responsive to the community and enhancing the quality of life with an emphasis on regional partnerships and collaborations. Mr. Hanna has served in leadership roles at the state level, including serving on the Governor's Blue Ribbon Task Force and Stewardship Program, the Governor's Commission on State and Local Partnerships for 21st Century, the Governor's Task Force on State and Local Government, and was appointed by three consecutive governors as chairman of the Wisconsin Land Council. He is presented at the State of Wisconsin Economic Summit three and is a founding director of the Local Government Institute of Wisconsin. He is a past president of Wisconsin Alliance of Cities and currently serves as president of the Wisconsin League of Municipalities. Please welcome Karen Nelson and Tim Hanna. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> welcome to Grand Shoot. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a few Grand Chute residents clapping over there, that's good, yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, this is my clicker, I guess, huh? 
All right. Um, it's great to be with you this morning. I'm going to start, and then I'm going to hand it off to, uh, to Karen. So I want to start by um, start at the beginning, give you a little bit bigger context of talking about diversity and inclusion in the city of Appleton and just how it came to be, how, what our, uh, how our emphasis came to be. And I have to tell you, Karen, put this PowerPoint together, so um, don't let the next slide scare you, <laughs> okay? So um, yeah, that's, that's one of my better days. <clears throat> so um, it was mentioned that uh, we do strategic planning and uh, so I've been the mayor since 1996. About uh, 1998, 99, I asked one of our staff members, can you do some research, find some best practices? Find me some cities that are doing a really great job of strategic planning. And she came back and said, can't find any. <laughs> there weren't many cities doing strategic planning back in the late 90s. I said, well, OK, then let's start. And so we started. And um, of course, uh, I have come to, to, to talk about our strategic planning as uh, it really starts with our, our why, right? Why do we come to work? Why do we exist? And that's our mission. That mission has not changed. As a city, as an organization, our job is we're dedicated to meeting the needs of the community and enhancing the quality of life. That's our job. Everything we do focuses on meeting that mission. Um, today, we were talking at breakfast, I said one of the things I'm most proud of is if you ask any one of our employees, I think just about every one of them can tell you what the mission is of the city. They can also tell you how their job impacts our ability to achieve our mission. Um, and that's, I'm really proud of that. They know why they come to work. Doesn't matter what they do. They know why they show up in the morning. That's a great thing. And of course, the next step of, of strategic planning is your vision, your aspiration. What do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? And so this is our vision. Our vision is that Appleton is the place where people can use their talents to thrive. And the way I look at that is there's assumptions, some assumptions in there. Number one, every single person has talent. Every person has some talent. Some people just don't know what their talent is. But everybody has talent. When I look at our vision, I say, what that means is if you find yourself, not just in Appleton, but in our community, that we are going to do everything we can to use the resources we have, not just as a city, but as a community, to help you be the best you you can be. That's our vision for where we live. There's a couple of key words there in that mission, and one of them is community. Notice that the city's mission statement talks about meeting the needs of the community and enhancing the quality of life. It doesn't say meet the needs of the city. Now, aren't those two different things? Really? I can put a map up. I can show you where the city starts and stops. All right, I, I just greeted you from, we're in Grand Chute right now. But really, aren't we in the same community? Community is really about relationships. It's about how we live our life. I don't live my life inside the borders of the city of Appleton. I live my life in this community just like everybody else. And so in trying to achieve our mission, it begs the question, who else is out there trying to meet the needs of the community? And how can we work with them to ultimately achieve that mission? And that leads to a lot of partnerships and collaborations and a lot of discussion and sometimes some angst and competition and but in the end it's really all about meeting the needs of the community not just the city so um, the next step is uh, key strategies these are the strategies that we employ this is not the plan the plan exists within our different functions but our different functions or our different departments each have to use these strategies to frame the services that they provide. And you can see them up there, delivering excellent service, active community participation, recognize and grow everyone's talents. That's both internally, inside the organization, as well as externally. Continually assess trends affecting the community and, and 
actually that should be proactively respond. Uh, promote an environment that's respectful and inclusive, which is what we're here to talk about today. Create opportunities, learn from failures. It's all about risk taking and how it's okay to take risk as long as we learn and communicating our successes. So those are the strategies. I hope when you think about Appleton, you can see that those strategies play out in the way that we deliver our services and some of the other services that we do offer, that this is really the framework for those. In fact, uh, a week ago, I just asked my department directors, you know what, it's time. Got to update our strategic plans. So uh, that's, our, that's our task for early next year. So that's the, the big context. So why the focus on diversity and inclusion? Not just that it's part of this strategic plan, but we've actually had the position of this type since 1997. And um, it really started with the police department and their recognition that there needed to be a better connection with our growing Asian population in the city of Appleton. And uh, Chief Myers, uh, former Chief Myers, uh, arrived in 1995 and we had a conversation in 1997 talking about, so this is a time when in the city of Appleton, our population, we were about 97% white. And we're talking about diversity. Why? Because uh, really it started with the Hmong population. We had a significant Hmong population that had resettled here after the Vietnam War, starting in the late 1970s. Our community opened their arms and, and well, let me put it this way. Some of our faith community and our churches opened their arms and welcomed people here to resettle. But 20 years later, significant portion of that Hmong population still didn't feel welcome here. Didn't feel like they were part of the community. That was number one. We felt that that had to change. And number two, we knew that demographically, the face of our community was going to change over time. And so, as we're having that conversation, um, Chief Myers, and we've always prided ourselves in having a, a really good working relationship with the Appleton Area School District. Another very visionary superintendent, Dr. Tom Scullin, who we work closely with, uh, with us. Chief Myers and Tom Scullin came and said, you know what, we propose to split a position share a position to start to address this issue of, of minority populations not feeling welcome here. Because they, they saw it in the schools also. And so we said, okay. The city budgeted for half the position. The school district budgeted for half the, half the position. They did the uh, interviews and uh, hired our first intercultural relations coordinator, uh, Dr. Pam Herr, back in 1997. Well, it didn't take more than a month or two for Pam to say, I'm just overwhelmed. <laughs> there is so much work to do uh, in forming these relationships. And so in 1998, both organizations funded the position full time. And in 1999, the city hired Sarah Druckery as the second intercultural relations coordinator. Now at this time, that position was housed in the police department and really focused on establishing relationships with minority populations uh, with the police department so that they could begin to feel safe and welcome here. Um, Sarah was there until 2002, at which time uh, they hired Mito, Mito Kodaka. Uh, and Mito was in that position until 2006. 2006, and, and I have to say, there were years, there were very lean years in that, in that time frame, especially 2003-04, where uh, we had significant cuts in state aid to the city. Um, in the 2004 budget, 
we actually cut our city staff by 5%. And so that position was front and center on a lot of people's mind. Like, why do we, do we really need that? Do we really need it? Can't we do without that? And the answer was no, not really. We do need that position, and it survived. It survived that very lean year. And so uh, in two, when Mito left in 2006, I took that opportunity to say, you know what, this needs a wider focus. We really need to focus on the entire community. Wait a second, what's our mission? Meeting the needs of the community and enhancing the quality of life. And I always like to add, for every person, to that mission statement. So I proposed that really belongs in the mayor's office so that it has a much broader focus and uh, convinced the council to put it in the mayor's office for a few years when again we found it on the chopping block and during those years we hired Nicole Lemke and then uh, Nicole uh, went off and started having babies and but didn't want to give up the, the job so we did a job share with Nicole and Polly Mua uh, during that time, we actually hosted the National Hmong Conference in Appleton, the smallest venue ever for the National Hmong Gathering. We were really proud to, to hold that here, to be on the radar. Um, in 2009, we changed the title from Intercultural Relations Coordinator to Diversity Coordinator and hired Kathy Flores, and Kathy was in that position for seven years. Now and again, went through some lean years. Uh, is this really what we need? And the council, uh, one of those years said, you know what, if we're gonna invest in this position, it really should be focused on economic development. Okay. Um, if that's what it takes to keep the position. And when I reflect back, I think it's, it was probably a good thing. It was a, it was a reflection that you know what, having a diverse population, a growing diverse population, and one that feels welcome here is good for the local economy. So it was a beginning of a recognition that that, is, that should be a driving factor. I don't necessarily agree it should be the driving factor, but it is a factor. Um, Kathy was here until 2016, and when she left, um, I took that opportunity to take a look at the job description and uh, beefed up the job description, gave it more responsibility, um, more responsibility to work with in the organization as well as externally in the community, um, and went back to the council and convinced them to move it back to my office where it really belonged. And we did that, and I was lucky enough to have this lovely lady apply for the job and and hire her. I don't know how we got so lucky, but um, so Karen's been here for about a year and a half uh, in the position. So one of the first things, so in the interim, when we were going through the process of kind of changing the job description, getting it refocused, going through the hiring process, I had always thought about, we had tried a few things in the past to, to engage the community in being welcoming and inclusive. And so we had talked to the business community in our downtown business group about a welcoming and inclusive campaign. And for some reason that offended some people. And, and it was offensive like, I don't need a sticker on my window to let people know that I'm welcoming or that I'm inclusive. That's the kind of response. So, okay, I get it, I get it. And they didn't want to feel peer pressure to have to sign up for anything like that. So I always had in the back of my mind, there's got to be, there has to be a way to do this. To have some kind of campaign that's very positive. And this is, remember what's happening. 
2016, 17, it continues to happen today. You see issues, they play out on national TV. There's race issues in, in uh, cities across the country. And right, part of strategic planning, be proactive. Think about things before they're problems. Be proactive in solving problems. We don't want that to happen here. We want, and, and not just for the bad, but we want to be known as a place where no matter who you are, you're welcome here. You're part of our community. That's the goal, right? The vision, a place where every person can use their talents to thrive, every person, no matter who they are. So how do we achieve that? How do we stand up in the face of the, kind of all the negative stuff going on uh, around the country? Well, I found myself in Pittsburgh at the National League of Cities Conference um, in 2016. And um, was, uh, I, and I actually had never been to Pittsburgh and I loved it. It was, it's gotten, it's going on in Pittsburgh. They had a really good vibe in Pittsburgh. But I'm taking a walk downtown and I walk by this building and it's got these big posters. And I start reading, and it's like, that's perfect. I actually still have the pictures on my phone. I took pictures of these folders, of these posters. <clears throat> Dignity and respect. Making our world a better place for all to live with all of our differences. Dignity and respect campaign. And I started reading those, and I took pictures. This is perfect. I'm going to steal this. That's what we do in local government. We steal good ideas from each other. <laughs> um, I'm going to steal this. So I came back, right? And uh, I talked to Kathy Flores, because we were still friends. And I talked to her. And I go, what do you think of this? Oh, yeah, I like it. Talked to the people at Lawrence University. What do you think of this? Yeah, it, it sounds good. I couldn't wait to hire the next person. So I hired Karen. And on the first day, I said, all right, here's what I want you to do. And I pulled out my phone and I showed her the, showed her the posters. And I said, I want you to do some research and find out about this campaign because I, I think this is good for us. This is our opportunity to be intentional about who we are and who we want to be. It's always who I believed we are as a community. I believe we have a very compassionate, very generous community. And so when I hear about racist comments being thrown out on College Avenue, it just makes me angry. And I go, that's not who we are. But we need to give people the tools to stand up and say out loud, this is who we are. Not just walk away and be frustrated like I was. And I saw this as that opportunity. So I'm going to turn it over to Karen, and she will tell you what her response was that first day on the job when I pulled this out and said, here's what I want you to do. So let's welcome Karen Nelson. Remember that year, 2016, while he's in Pittsburgh, walking around with Mayor Bill Peduto. Meanwhile, the same year, I attended the National Diversity Conference in Atlanta, got my nose out of my statistics book long enough and my marketing books from my executive MBA class, classes at UWM, and said, you know what, I think I need to go down to Atlanta and check out the National Diversity Conference just to kind of be sure I keep you know, sharpening the saw so that when this great opportunity came around after graduation, I'd be ready. Little did I know that while I was there, that I would meet the founder of the Dignity and Respect campaign, trained by her directly, got my little CEU credits, and went back to Milwaukee, got my nose back into my books and preparing for graduation, going, what am I going to do with this new found wonderful opportunity called the Dignity and Respect Campaign. I want to implement it somewhere. Am I going to get a new client to do it? Am I going to get a new job that's going to allow me to do that? He pulls out these pictures 
as you see before you on the first day. And I said, that's right, sir. I'm your girl Friday. <laughs> Kismet. That's right. <laughs> so the national effort of uh, which Appleton is now the first city in the state of Wisconsin to take on the Dignity and Respect <laughs> campaign. Why is this important? The U.S. demographics are changing. They've been changing for many years. It first started <coughs> with the creation of the diversity industry in the 1980s by Dr. Roosevelt Thomas. And some people were early adopters, such as my earlier, uh, my former employer, uh, GE Medical Systems in Waukesha, where I became the first cultural diversity manager for them, um, for all of the United States, Latin America, and Canada. They got it right very quickly. But some other companies and organizations decided to shrink back, saying, oh, it's never going to change from 83% uh, white. And then there were smart communities, such as Appleton in 1997 that had the foresight the very next decade to say, you know what, we're going to take this seriously, even at a time when this community was still 97% white. Because as you continue to look at this graph behind me, it is now projected that somewhere between the years 2040 and 2050, that decade, is going to be the year that America is going to shift to a majority minority country. The demographics are not going away. And I'm so proud to be in a community that took that initiative over 20 years ago. The Dignity and Respect campaign was, began on January the 16th of this year. I purposefully chose the date of January 16th for the kickoff at Lawrence University because it was the day after the National Dr. King birthday holiday. What better way to live out the values of Dr. King beyond his birthday holiday than to kick it off on that day? So here's the mission. The Dignity and Respect campaign empowers individuals and communities and organizations to create environments where all can live, work, learn, and play. That's our entire life, ladies and gentlemen. Where we live, that's our neighborhoods. Where we work, not only inside of the walls of City Hall, but also beyond. Where we learn, our schools, our libraries, any kind of learning environment, and of course where we play, and of course our Parks and Recs department and all of our sports teams are super uh, involved with this. Raise your hand if you believe you deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. In every circumstance, people of all ages and backgrounds raise their hand and say, of course, I deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And then I ask the second question, raise your hand if you believe you treat others with dignity and respect. Well, in response to the second question, everyone raises a hand, but in many cases they look around to see who else is raising their hand. This happens every time without fail. You see, although we have conviction about wanting to be treated with dignity and respect, we are often inconsistent about treating others with dignity and respect. The Dignity and Respect campaign, it sits in the intersection of I want it and I do it. And we are laser focused on making our world a better place for all to live, work, learn, and play with all of our differences. Well, we do this by providing resources to remind individuals, organizations, communities, schools and youth programs and sports teams to treat others with dignity and respect. See, this is what we know. We want to live in communities where we and our families are treated with dignity and respect and that we're treated in a respectful manner from the businesses that we patronize to our daily interactions with others. We want to work in organizations with a commitment to dignity and respect regardless of position level, title, and we also want to ensure that that includes our interactions with our employees, with customers, and the community that is served. 
by the organization. We want our children to learn, to attend schools, and to participate in youth programs where they are treated with dignity and respect, where they're free from bullying, stereotyping, and violence. We want to play sports, and we want our children to play sports, where dignity and respect are foundational building blocks, both on and off the field. The campaign is based on 30 tips of dignity and respect, simple but important behaviors to help us demonstrate dignity and respect in our interactions. Involvement in the campaign often begins with the Dignity and Respect Pledge. I will do my part to make our world a better place by treating everyone with dignity and respect. Now the seven pillars, they reinforce the 30 tips through online modules and facilitated workshops. And they're focused on individual, team, and organizational engagement. And then we have Dignity and Respect initiatives. They strengthen the campaign and your involvement through activities that promote respect for self, others, and the community. Let's begin by treating ourselves well. We're focused on learning about and taking steps to build and create a healthy mind, body, and soul. Because when we are healthy, we are also able to remain mindful about our interactions with others. Let's make some new friends and help create safer spaces to learn about others. Our initiatives offer opportunities to learn about others, and we know this, that differences are only barriers when we allow them to be. And let's get involved, and let's encourage others as well. Our initiatives help to create greater awareness about bullying in schools and sexual assault, domestic and community violence. Today, more than 100 organizations, youth programs, and schools have joined the Dignity and Respect campaign. What began as an internal initiative at UPMC, a global healthcare provider and insurer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, has become a national campaign inspiring people across the nation. Join us. At your tables, we passed out earlier this brochure and this pledge card. On the pledge card is the hot link that we are currently unable to get to on the internet directly. So I'm inviting you to, in your own time, on your smartphones, to enter that browser, that address into your browser, and then you can also meet the founder. Uh, her name is Candy Castleberry Singleton, who is the founder of the Dignity and Respect Campaign, and you'll be invited to take the pledge at that time. So this is intended to be a journey where we will be imagining, experiencing, and championing living with dignity and respect. As Mr. Mayor said already, giving people, equipping us with the language, a uniform language that all of us can use to feel empowered to vocalize when we see ill-doing in the community. So at this point, I would like for you to please raise your dominant hand and take the Dignity and Respect Pledge with me. Thank you. That's, that's Dignity, uh, uh, diversity speak for if you're right-handed, right-handed, lefty, lefty, exactly. <laughs> so your dominant hand. I will do my part to make the world a better place by treating everyone with dignity and respect. Thank you. I changed the words from the city of Appleton, sir, since we were outside of the bounds of the city. <laughs> So the Dignity and Respect campaign uh, actually takes place in four stages. Number one is to th take the online pledge that's again using that pledge card that's now in front of you uh, and going to the browser and taking the pledge online. And then the second step is to model the seven pillars which are on the inside of the brochure that's also available at your tables 
and the third is to practice the 30 tips. So those are the two genres, if you will, that the Dignity and Respect campaign is predicated on. And so the fourth is then to participate in our initiatives. So what are our initiatives, Karen? I thought you'd never ask. So uh, this has been a very busy year for me in the community, uh, starting, of course, with City Hall and the uh, survey that I conducted with all of the city employees. And then was the kickoff event. This is us here with the uh, local leaders and the community. Also, the Common Council each took the pledge as well. I want to get them on my side, so. Because <laughs> as, as you can hear, my position gets under fire a lot. <laughs> uh, do we really need that? And so far for 20, for 20 plus years now, the mayor has won that argument. So, uh, and, and we also are very proud of the fact that Mr. Mayor uh, actually and I hosted the first Wisconsin Government Alliance on Race Equity in the state of Wisconsin back in March uh, here in the city of Appleton and it was uh, received very, very widely. And so now you will be hearing about more municipalities wanting to now begin this kind of campaign and perhaps even creating this position within their municipalities. Secondly, uh, for the second quarter, was a very busy quarter as you can see also. That's the time when I began engaging the community through these community or uh, conversations. In April was the intergenerational uh, discussion. In May, we talked about uh, historically black colleges and universities, of which I am the product of one. Bennett College was featured in the film that was shown at the Appleton Public Library, and we had a community conversation following that. June was a very busy month with the Dignity and Respect Survey being rolled out to the residents on our Facebook page for the city and an expansion of activities around Juneteenth, including a Unity in the Community Forum at Family First Ministries and ending the month with the LGBTQ Pride Panel discussion at Goodwill Industries, which was also very well received. The third quarter, which is uh, just ended, <laughs> July through September, we actually invited people to have uh, conversations beyond their own comfort level, if you will, with our diversity community cookout in partnership with Celebrate Diversities, Fox Cities. Uh, you see the mayor there at uh, speaking with an Indian family. And that went on across all of the park uh, in, in Menasha. And we purposely asked people to, uh, we actually had it color coded for, for people to sit uh, with families and groups and individuals that they did not know with uh, a facilitator-led discussion at their tables. Then uh, the center picture we're very proud of because that was us kicking off, the mayor and I kicking off the Dignity and Respect campaign at the Appleton Area School District with nearly 2,000 people in attendance at their welcome event, kickoff event for the new year uh, at the end of August of this year as they were kicking off the new school year. And now we are very proud to say that the Dignity and Respect campaign is now in every single Appleton Area School District School, and there may be more to come with that. <coughs> On September 15th, around the pillar of building cultural awareness, we marched down College Avenue holding our banner to Houdini Plaza for our first Rhythms of the World Multicultural Festival of Performances, Exhibits, and Food from many cultural backgrounds. So that was my first uh, three quarters of this year. So where do we go from here? We're now into the fourth quarter where we are really amping up uh, the walk in our shoes, uh, lending a hand uh, and compassionate collaboration the Walk in Our Shoes was, was recently on the front page of Post Crescent. We're very proud of that fact that it was a very successful event. It was an, a local Latino immigrants uh, simulation event funded by Theta Care. And of course, we had another uh, very successful Fox Cities Reads uh, citywide reading campaign. And we'll be closing out the year with that. So in summary, as you look to promote diversity and inclusion within your strategic planning process, you saw the overall umbrella that the mayor presented earlier. But here's what's underlying that, that you need to pull, put together for your own. Build personal relationships. You heard the mayor talk about that. That's step number one. 
because Chief Rick Myers came to this newly elected pre uh, mayor at the time and said, we've got to figure out what we're going to do about this growing Hmong population. Do we just continue to sit over here in City Hall and say, oh, let's just let them work it out, figure it out on their own? Or do we proactively go into the community and build that relationship? They chose to do number one, create a welcoming atmosphere. We even have gone to the point in City Hall where we even now have provided our, uh, we just recently had a major midterm election, so we have had uh, all of the uh, voting resources translated and resources available in Hmong and also in Spanish. So that tells people that they're welcome. Increase accessibility, that's what the translations also provide and also developing alternate methods of engagement, going to various festivals, all of their meetings, maintaining a presence within the community, and partnering with diverse organizations and agencies. The list goes on. So in conclusion, you'll see that the mayor and I wear these lapel pins that say, I will do my part. And now we are inviting you to also do your part making our world a better place for all to live with all of our differences. Thank you. So um, we're happy to take uh, questions. Um, just a few closing comments. Um, in, in today's world where there's just intense competition for talent, and in a world where people are deliberately choosing where they want to live, I think this is really important. This puts us on the radar map for a wide spectrum of people across the country. When they see that we're being intentional about this, um, it gets their attention. And I can tell you that I've had conversations, I wish I had a better way to measure this rather than just anecdotally, but I have had more conversations in the last year and a half with people who are intentionally choosing to move to Appleton. And this is one of the reasons. So we're, we're bending that curve in terms of attracting talent to come into our community. That's number one. Number two, if you really want to know what our community is going to look like in a few years, take the opportunity to visit one of our elementary schools and take a look at the makeup of those classes. That'll tell you what the demographic makeup of our community is going to be in a few years. It's incredible. It's exciting. It's exciting. So that's, uh, that's what we're up to. <laughs> and I told Karen, this is not a one-year thing. This, <laughs> oh, this, is a, this is a forever thing, OK? We are forever going to be hammering on dignity and respect. That's who we are. That's who we want to be. And we're seeing signs that uh, other organizations are starting to adopt the language mm -hmm. and use the language in what they're doing and that there's that's very gratifying to me it means it's taking hold it's becoming part of the culture we're starting to be intentional about it so I would invite you to go back to your workplaces take a look at the information if you want more information you can contact us Karen <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, my uh, name yeah. and phone number and email are on your card but uh, I invite you to be um, part of this community-wide campaign and even up in De Pere. <laughs> Actually, I've had some really great conversations with Mayor Walsh and your city manager, uh, Larry. Um, they're, they're, they're aware of this and they're interested in it and, um, and I'm, I'm happy. We've Actually, we've been contacted by a few other cities around Wisconsin that have understood what we're doing and have been invited to come and, and give them more information so I hope it just I hope it spreads I hope it spreads I hope Wisconsin becomes known as a place where people can come and be accepted not that cold frozen tundra with all those white people up on the <laughs> northern part of the map right exactly. no this is a it is a great place and it can be even better so we're happy to take any questions that, that you might have Is this campaign specifically for cities, or is it something that could be tailored for colleges, for businesses? All of the above. Okay. 
Yes. We started with, why don't you tell them where it started? Yes, so uh, that's right, since you didn't get to see the video, you'll see that when you go to it on your own, but it started at UPMC, United uh, Healthcare of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center, and with them being the largest employer in the city of Pittsburgh with some 40 or 50,000 employees, it then spread out into the community, and that's when Mayor Bill Peduto said, I want to be a part of this citywide. Then the county executive of Allegheny County said, I want to be a part of this, and next thing you know, it ended up in various organizations, communities, as well as schools. So it is applicable. I, I would say, if you're interested in doing this, do it. Don't wait for the government. Right. Okay. <laughs> Don't wait for the government to do it. We're you just lucky though, impact, that our government's you can doing that. Mm -hmm. The community, if you are an employer, no matter how large or how small you are, you can have an impact on the culture in your community mm -hmm. by doing this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I saw another hand and then I'll come to you. I noticed that you also you had some activities in Menasha. So mm -hmm. do you see the seeping out of just the city of Appleton into the surrounding communities and and you two being an active part of that or working with other local governments? How do you see that growing? Yes. I think the way that, that this happens is we work with organizations that are community-wide. If the other communities want to do it as part of their initiative, we're happy to help them. I'm not going to push it on them, um, but if they want to be part of it, we're, we're happy, to, happy to join with them. But, I, but again, it's those, it's those uh, for-profit and non-profit organizations who are very engaged, and um, they're the ones who really they don't have lines on a map. They cover the community, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're happy to work with them. Thank you. Thank you. So, how old is the campaign in general? Not at the city level, but you know, nationally. Nationally, then how many communities, or I don't know how widespread it is. Sure. Some perspective on that. This is the tenth year of the national campaign. It started in two thousand and eight at UPMC, and we are the 101st organization to implement it, and the first in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Thank All right. you. We'll be next nice to each other. I'd like to uh, thank Karen. First of all, welcome to, to the valley, and know that the valley goes all the way up to De Pere. Um, and Mayor Tim, thank you for your leadership, your many years of leadership, and both of you, thank you for bringing attention to equity, inclusion, and, and uh, respect and dignity. We're appreciative of that, and so thank you for being here today. Give them another round of applause, please. I can also say, uh, Mayor Tim, that yesterday, uh, Mayor Walsh's staff did not trust him with the clicker. He, he said he was not clicker worthy. You're pretty good with the clicker. I'll, I'll let the mayor know he's got something to aspire uh, from, from Appleton there. Yeah, I, I will. Um, uh, I hope you join us uh, at the next uh, CEO Breakfast Series, November 20th at St. Edward College. Mark Casper, CEO of Amerhart, will present on supplying the housing industry challenges and opportunities. Uh, we do uh, hope to see you there. Also, if you're interested in a copy of today's presentation, Lisa Gray is right back here. You can wave your hand if you'd like to copy of today's presentation, please uh, let her know. Uh, it's our privilege to have you here. Uh, thank you, have a great day.